So should we start in two minutes? Two minutes of the. So, Arun sir, are we ready to go? We'll start at 7.29, 7.30. Arun sir? Hello? Yeah, okay. are we good to go, sir? Yes, sure. Yes, so, team, team River, are you all ready? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so can you just go to the next slide? Can you go to the program director slide? Program director slides. The next slide. Yeah. So we'll start in next five, four, three, two, one. So good evening, all. I, on behalf of Mumbai Oncology Association, would like to invite you all for the Academy of Lung Cancer, Bone Metastasis in Lung Cancer. Without a further ado, I would like to invite our program director, Dr. Arun Gupta. He is a consultant interventional radiologist from Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, to give us the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Hello everyone, I welcome you all for this webinar uh, which is conducted by Academy of Lung Cancer and uh, every month we are doing program related with the issue with the lung cancer and this time the theme of this webinar is bone metastasis. Uh, any bone metastasis, whether it is lung or any other cancer has various issues and we are going to discuss uh, these issues and how to manage this and uh, we have a very good esteemed faculty. Uh, so without any delay, I would like to first invite the chairpersons of our first session is Dr. K. Pavitran. He is professor and head department of medical oncology, Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi. Uh, Dr. Shyam Agrawal uh, possibly is going to join uh, very soon. So Dr. K. Pavitran, please uh, proceed with our program. I welcome you. Thank you, Dr. Iron, because uh, as uh, you all know, bone metastasis is a common problem in patients with lung cancer, and it adds to the morbidity and mortality. So here we are going to discuss the issues. And the first one is the issue of bone metastasis in lung cancer, role of chemotherapy by Dr. Priya Tiwari, who is a senior consultant medical oncologist at Artemis Hospital, Gurgaon. Over to Dr. Priya, please. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Doctor Pavitran, uh, and thank you, uh, Doctor Atul, for a wonderful opportunity. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen. Sure, ma'am. Team, can you please stop the share? Yes, ma'am. You can go ahead, ma'am. Yes. So I slightly modified the topic in the sense that uh, why just discuss chemotherapy? There are a lot of other things happening in the lung cancer, especially with the metastatic lung cancer. So let's incorporate that also in our understanding and carry that forward in the topic. So I think the slides are visible. Yes, ma'am, your slides are visible, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So bone metastasis is a big problem in lung cancer. It is one of the common sites for metastasis. And now with increasing usage of PET scan, we are finding more and more patients having bone metastasis at baseline and around 40 to 50 percent of patients might have uh, bone metastasis at baseline. The very important part about bone metastasis is they add a uh, significant burden as far as the symptomatic burden is concerned. They hear major amount of pain affecting quality of life, interfering with sleep. You can also have fractures, compressive symptoms and yes, hypercalcemia. 
Also, many of the times patient might have concomitant bone marrow involvement and cytopenias are a common manifestation then. It really becomes important because the main history of the treatment many of the times is chemotherapy and doublet chemotherapy and we are constantly thinking that do, should we modify the doses of chemotherapy because chemotherapies again will cause some kind of bone marrow suppression. Some very important consideration. Uh, compared to many other sites of metastatic disease, such as distant lymph nodal metastasis, bone metastasis portends a poor prognosis. Also, when it comes to taking a sample, bone is one of the least preferred option for the biopsy. There are technical challenges. Also, there is a longer processing time. And sometimes we see there is difficulty in doing an immunohistochemistry in the bone metastatic uh, sample. Immunohistochemistry in lung cancer is very important. It helps us to differentiate small cell lung cancer versus non-small cell lung cancer. Also, the various subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer, such as adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma. Also, in, especially in the lung cancer, the world has moved to newer horizons. We have now incorporated molecular tests for which we need a big amount of sample and a sample, and so not just FNACs, and a sample where the DNA extraction, the genetic material extraction is easier. So bone is not one of those sites. Why do we need these samples? Because we want to do analysis such as next generation sequencing fish to pick up the various mutations so that patient can be considered for targeted therapies. We see both osteoblastic metastasis and osteolytic metastasis. Osteoblastic are more, more commonly seen in a small cell and osteolytic in non-small cell. So how to uh, treat this patient? We have investigated, we have documented the site of bone metastasis in lung cancer. So it has to be a multi-pronged approach. There has to be symptomatic therapy. And when the patient comes to us, we have we also know that there are certain, uh, what is called as skeletal related events, SREs. Uh, this is a definition of SREs. If the patient requires radiation to bone surgeries, or is there a pathological fracture, spinal cord compression, hypercalcemia, all these are SREs. So if this is happening, then to prevent these events, we need to treat the bone disease. This is not just by the anti-cancer therapy, but also some, something called as the bisphosphonates and denosumab. And yes, the main stay of therapy because the bone metastasis means that you have a systemic uh, disease. So you have to take care of the systemic, um, uh, you have to uh, do the systemic therapy. Chemotherapy and the other groups of drug which have now come in the lung cancer is anti-angiogenic. Therapies, so the drugs which are actually targeting the tumor blood supply, bevacizumab, beva remusirumab, and newer in the list is immunotherapies such as nivolumab, pembrolizumab. Also, we now have targeted therapies. I just uh, enumerated that yes, we are doing these tests to find out particular uh, onco drivers, and, and one of them could be EGFR, L cross, and other pathways. So yes, uh, just to give an idea about the osteoclast inhibition. So when the patient comes, we evaluate, we find that, okay, these are the sites of uh, 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 bone metastasis. These are the symptoms and the problems happening because of the bone metastasis. And accordingly, we address. But at the same time, we do something called as osteoclast inhibition to reduce SIs, which I just enumerated. So there are two groups of drug. One is the bisphosphonate. The most commonly used bisphosphonate is the zolidronic acid. At some point of time, pemidronate was also being used. The other class of drug is the denosumab. Now, in certain lung cancer trials have shown that denosumab might have a, uh, uh, like a better efficiency in the terms of more delayed progression to first SRE. Uh, these injections, uh, uh, both are in the form of injections. Zoridronic is also in the form of uh, injection and denosumab, but the route of administration is different. Denosumab is only a subcutaneous injection, so it might be much more convenient for the patient, but also it is much more costly. Zoridronic acid is intravenous infusion and at some point of time we were all giving them once a month infusion but now there is a practice change and some data is evolving especially in other cancers that you can also administer them once in three months with equal efficacy. Uh, they do have certain side effects both of them cause osteonecrosis of a jaw hypocalcemia so that is why it's very important to see the concomitant calcium levels and the vitamin d levels also denosumab can cause urinary tract infection and zoridronic acid and can cause something called as bisphosphonate syndrome which uh, uh, is like fever chills rigors flu like sym symptoms are very much common and yes it also requires greater in monitoring um, a, a brief discussion about cancer induced symptoms, especially bone pains. Uh, it could be a ba background pain with the episodes of bre breakthrough pain, which is defined as a sudden flare up of the bone pain, severe enough to be perceived in spite of pain medication being taken. And bone pains are a very common cause of debilitating breakthrough pains. 
so we follow who pain ladder that we start with the milder nsaid or the acetaminophen based uh, uh, painkillers then we go to lower potency then higher potency and uh, opioids and we also take into consideration the other modalities such as radiation therapy a very useful adjunct to the treatment are steroids because they decrease the edema or the inflammation associated with the metastatic disease and they are very much needed and used in the management of bone pain and more so if the patient has spinal cord compression so now coming to the anti cancer therapy so when the patients have bone metastasis we know that in majority of patient it is with a palliative intent so the quality of life and the treatment related side effects are very important uh, we tend to prefer combination therapies because they have help us to achieve a better response rate however at the same time we need to look into the patient performance status as well as comorbidities and the risk benefit ratio of every intervention should be kept in the mind use the drug with non overlapping toxicities and now there are options which are combining chemotherapy drugs with immunotherapies or targeted therapies such as bevacizumab or the tkis if the patient have egfr inhibitors and do consider if the patient has pre existing cytopenias in deciding your line of management this is the list to show what are the common chemotherapy drugs being used um, in the lung cancer the main forte the main is the mainstay of the uh, treatment is usually in the first line and in the combination therapies are either of one of the platinum cisplatinum versus car carboplatinum cisplatinum might be slightly more efficacious yeah. compared to carboplatinum the other drugs are texanes uh, paclitaxel docetaxel napaclitaxel gemcitabine binorelbin etoposide pemetrexate is a chemotherapy drug reserved usually for adenocarcinoma now the site of metastatic disease in the form of bone does not make much difference to the efficacy of various anti cancer drug uh, brain is a site where we know that not all cancer drugs have equal penetration so there we see a look into uh, uh, drugs penetrating blood brain barrier but that is not so with the uh bone metastasis and the extent of bone metastasis type of bone metastasis does not make a difference to the choice of our chemotherapy options uh, a very important thing is uh, chemotherapy associated flare and this is very important from the radiology point of view uh, see we have we have been hearing about flares in lot of cancers especially breast cancer prostate cancer it is a less common um, in lung cancer however it is known Uh, why does it happen? Because it represents a rapid healing repair around the responding lesion. It might represents a successful response. So you have an increased activity of the healing process going on, and that is why you see a flare. So this is a borrowed case report where we see a primary and a bone metastasis in the humerus. And as the patient uh, responded to the treatment, we see shrinking of the primary lesion. However, uh, actually the bone metastatic disease showed increased uptake. So it was actually labeled as a progression. however when the drug was stopped the treatment we see a progression in the primary but the metastatic site continued to show a decreased uptake actually the uptake went down further low so flare is also should always be considered especially in the bone lesions it's a very important uh, parameter because if you are not considering flare you might uh, label patient as progression and uh, change the treatment and yes uh, uh, get uh, um, so what happens that the patient becomes like there was one useful regimen which was working well and now uh, the patient is not no more receiving that treatment it is somehow more commonly seen in non small cell but yes also reported in small cell lung cancer so yes what beyond chemotherapies uh, multiple newer treatment options thankfully so uh, this is how the journey of targeted therapies and now immunotherapy is evolving the egfr was the first driver mutation uh, found in the lung cancer and subsequently we had egfr targeted therapies the beauty of these treatment is that the patient for a stage 4 cancer is simply taking a tablet and sitting at home and he did not come to the opd so we are getting lot of egfr agents now the journey started from gefitinib erlotinib bafatinib dacomatinib and now osimertinib is latest in the list and now we are getting more and more other targets also such as alk and then ros etc now we also have something called as immunotherapy and yes um, simultaneously at some point of time the role of anti angiogenic agents also came is the bevacizumab was the first agent introduced and subsequently we also had remdesivir they act to decrease the tumor blood supply and yes that is why they act in synergism with the chemotherapy drug their use is more limited to the adenocarcinoma now tell talking about the immunotherapy what happens is when the cancer progresses 
it has uh, what it does it kind of does a immunosuppression in the body how does it do it that there are kind of cells which also uh, immune cells which are trying to kill uh, these tumor cells the t cells so what it does is cancer expresses certain molecules called as pdl1 ligands and they bind to the receptor pd1 on the t cells so by bind this binding these uh, there is an inhibition of t cell activity so this mechanism is very important because as the cancer grows it progresses it causes the immunosuppression the t cell immunity suppression which is actually taking care of these cancer cells so what the immunotherapy does it works by uh, uh, blocking getting rid of so you have pdl1 blockers pd1 blockers by so that this step is taken care of so there are various other kinds of immunotherapy but uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors are the one which are being much more commonly used now they are much more validated across the trials and uh, there are two kinds of immune checkpoint inhibitors the more important and the more readily available are the pdl1 the other group is ctl4 blockers the ipilimumab is the drug which is used from that class so just to give you a brief just to give you a, a brief insight into how are we actually managing the patients in a real world setting so whenever a patient with a bone metastasis comes to us we take all the history do all the workup and yes, we find out what are the histological subtypes, extent of disease, and then we do molecular testing, which I previously narrated, and we also do PDL1 test. So there is battery of tests which is being done, and after that, that helps us to decide our plan of management. Uh, if the patients, they don't have any targets, and if there is rapidity to control the symptoms, especially if the patient is having a lot of bone pains, we tend to start the patient on chemotherapies. There are chemotherapy drugs that I just enumerated, so we use combinations, and yes, many of the time, we combine them with either immunotherapy drugs or also anti-angiogenic agents. So the drugs which are commonly used for adenocarcinoma, pemetrexate, carboplatinum, or cisplatinum, along with immunotherapy drugs. So the immunotherapy drugs are pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, and yes, we also have other combinations of immunotherapy such as nivolumab and ipilimumab. So similarly, if the patient progresses on first line, we try to give the therapy which patient has not received in the first line. And this is how the, malignant, the stage 4 cancers are managed, uh, also including those with the bone metastasis. Similarly, for the squamous cell carcinomas, we have various treatment regimens. And here again, the pembrolizumab, that is the immunotherapy in combination with chemotherapies, are one of the front runners in the treatment armamentarium. So for the small cell lung cancer, we again have platinums along with etoposide as the mainstay of first line treatment, but also now addition of various immunotherapy drugs. Now, as I, uh, I said, there is a flare scene with uh, uh, this uh, chemotherapy uh, the immunotherapy also can cause certain problems which is called as pseudo progression so whenever we are giving patients immunotherapy drugs what happens there is an immune filtration immune infiltration of these cells so actually paradoxically the uptake and the size of the lesion will increase so sometimes there is something called as pseudo progression seen um, on the imaging a very important word about uh, various theranostics so especially for the uh, symptomatic management of the patients uh, there are few agents available to take care of the pain. If the patients have a lot of pain and especially if we feel that they are not fit for any other uh, chemotherapy, etc. And they don't have much time to live, estrontium 89, samarium are few agents they are, they are given and they help to decrease the pain. However, they cause significant bone marrow suppression and that can uh, of course limit the subsequent use of chemotherapy and hence they should be used very judiciously. Lutetium 177 is also the latest addition in this list. Let this list that is the use of this agent just for the control of pain we might be using lutetium 177 as a part of prrt therapies in certain cancer and i guess psma therapy for the prostate cancer but now this agent is also used as only for the pain control and it might cause less bone suppression compared to the previously um, this strontium or samarium so just to conclude, bone metastasis are common in lung cancer. They add to morbidity, protein poor prognosis, and the treatment has to be a multi-pronged approach. Anti-cancer therapy offers best palliation, out of which we have multiple options to choose. And yes, that is the way to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Priya, for the interesting presentation. Now I invite my co-chair, Dr. Shyam Agarwal, to take over. Dr. Shyam, please. Hello, Dr. Shamagarwala, sir, are you there? 
पवित्र सर कर डॉक्टर आशीष मुलिया ही नीड्स नो इंट्रोडक्शन ही इज प्रोफेसर ऑफ ऑर्थोपेडिक ऑंगोलॉजी टाटा मेमोरियल हॉस्पिटल मुंबई द टॉपिक इज सर्जिकल मैनेजमेंट ऑफ बोन मेटास्टासिस इन लंग कैंसर डॉक्टर आशीष प्लीज थैंक यू सो मच इफ यू कैन गिव मी प्रिविलेज टू स्क्रीन माय शेयर माय स्क्रीन आई विल यस यस या नाउ यू कैन शेयर Yes, sir. Slides are visible. Just I hope my slides are. Thank you. Just so full much. screen, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks to um, the Academy of Lung Cancer to uh, not only giving me the chance to speak to all of you, but also to to highlight this important topic, which which leads to enormous amount of morbidity in patients with lung cancer. Uh, and uh, in about next 15 minutes i would uh, try to highlight the salient points and the features how we try to manage surgically these lesions i am not sure if so the slides are not, not able to yeah i am not able to go ahead should i reshare my screen again yes so you can just reshare it yeah Yeah, is it happening? Is it visible to you? Yes, yes, sir. yes. I just moving now. Okay. Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Sorry for the uh, technical glitch. So we all understand that uh, the cancer burden is is increasing and it's a cause for massive cost, not just in India but across the globe. And metastatic bone disease and the, the treatment of the this accounts for about twenty percent of the cost involved. and this is all across that the skeletal related events which causes a lot of issues and causes involvement of various therapies and cost which is related mainly to the radiation of the bone the treatment of hypercalcemia the management of pathological fractures various kind of resection bone surgeries and obviously the metastasis of the spine contributing and adding to the cost of these uh, uh, these lesions and ultimately we need to understand that if we can prevent these lesions we can actually decrease the cost of of of, of these uh, treatment and maybe shift the paradigm from more surgical to more conservative where the costs are, are a bit less and the same thing uh, is, is 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 available in the uh, uh, india where the data has shown that we is going to have lots of patients with bone metastasis which require um, a great deal of management um, lung cancer accounts for about anywhere between 14 to 30% of uh, skeletal metastasis presenting to any tertiary cancer centers or i have put this figure especially for the women group because these numbers are less here but you can imagine that when we take uh, uh, account for the males the numbers are still very higher and and hence we know that about anywhere between 20 to 30% of the lesions which we see will be coming from lung cancers and there are some data just to highlight the same amount of issue that the kind of the lesions which we see in the bones require various sort of treatment it increases morbidity and requires surgical as well as conservative management in terms uh, of uh, radiotherapy and medical management as priya highlighted to you but but before we go further what we need to understand that a pathological fracture caused by any metastasis whether it is cl lung or something it is not an emergency and this we all need to understand we need to evaluate our patients in a great deal and i will show you few examples which will again highlight this that how evaluation can change the kind of management you do to a patient uh it anyways need fixation so you can plan if you have isolated lesions then can plan a biopsy prove the lesions and then go ahead with the management uh, the local management per se will not impact the prognosis of the disease and once it is stage 4 the cure becomes impossible but yes as priya highlighted and as 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 my 
colleagues and the team led by Dr. Kumar Prabhash are doing a great job in TMH. We are increasing the survival of these patients with this deadly disease more and more. So again, to highlight that the burden is increasing more and more, and lung is again a common tumor which leads to skeletal metastasis. Lytic lesions are most common. So about 90% of the lesions in CA lungs are seen as lytic lesions, which many times can get confused with various benign or other malignant lesions, and hence the diagnosis has to be perfect. In some patients, we see a mixed lytic and, and blastic kind of lesions, but predominantly the lesions which are seen are lytic. Spine is the most common site for the metastasis in CA lung and followed by proximal femur, humerus and pelvis. But what is very important to understand is that CA lung also throw metastasis to the distal sites. Typically, we see we say that if you have a skeletal lesion which is beyond the elbow and the knee, it is rare to be met. But whenever it is present, CA lung comes as the first diagnosis of differentials. Pain is the most common thing which the patient presents with. Along with that, there may be, uh, you know, increase in the pain on weight bearing, which 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 tells us that the integrity of the bone is compromised and we need to be very careful with these patients. And these patients do fracture a lot and present to us with uh, pathological fractures and inability to walk as well, but pain is the most common symptom. I have specifically kept these few slides to highlight that many a times I see in my practice that a lot of CA lung patients present to us only as bony lesions and where the primary is not known and hence we need to evaluate these patients in a particular way. So this and three in clinical of orthopedics which talk about a systematic or a step ladder pattern how you need to evaluate uh, um, uh, a bony mat lesion for an for an unknown primary but what has happened different in last one decade is that PET scan has evolved in a great way and that step ladder pattern which used to take about two to three weeks of time we have reduced it into days and where we can assess the primary as well as the uh, the skeletal lesions and hence the step ladder pattern has changed dramatically and now PET scan has become one of uh, the uh, foremost investigations the case of bone metastasis there are various articles which talks about the role of bone scan and whole body MRI, but I think this is just a therapeutic, uh, a theoretical discussion. PET scan remains the uh, state of art of investigations, which should help us to evaluate the primary as well as uh, the, the skeletal metastasis. One another important point which we need to understand that there are a few cases where in a known case of a primary, you can get secondary sarcomas as well. I have had a couple of patients who had CA lung and then they had sarcomas in soft tissues as well as in the bone. So one must be careful when evaluating a solitary bony lesion or a solitary soft tissue lesion even in a known case of previous malignancy. And there are articles which talks about that this percentage is uh, ranges between 5 to 17 percent depending upon the histopathologies and hence in these patients if you have any doubt if you see the solitary lesions you must ensure that you clinch the diagnosis by by doing a biopsy when it comes to the treatment the the, the foremost goal is to have the relief of the pain we need to ensure that pathological fracture or an impending impending fracture we must stabilize or we must ensure that it doesn't fracture we need to make sure that the patients who come to us with this morbidity should be functional and should be ambulant as early as possible and rarely in some instances we might have to do the resection of the entire bone to make sure that the mobilization happen immediately and we improve the quality of life coming to the surgery per se uh, we need to treat them but obviously we must not forget that it's a multidisciplinary treatment and hence 
discussion with the colleagues from the medical oncology and radiation oncology department is essential to have the optimum functional and oncological outcome for these patients. Priya very nicely elaborated about the non-surgical or the conservative management lines, but just to add a few is, is, is the adequate amount of bracing to give them the pain relief we can do embolization in in patients which are pretty vascular role of bisphosphonate she has highlighted very nicely and hormones and drug therapies are also covered coming to the operative treatment per se it will be guided by various factors and these will be number one the biological activity of the laser how aggressive is the disease and our surgical management aggressiveness will be inversely proportional to the biological aggressiveness of the disease anatomical location will change the way you manage these lesions, the diaphysial lesions of the long bone will be treated differently as compared to the osteoarticular lesions or periosteoarticular lesions and I will show you some examples. Obviously, as she alluded very nicely that there are a lot of uh, molecular tests and we have EGFR mutations which are better prognosis. So the response to the medical and radiotherapy also governs the kind of surgical management you execute in this patients. And last but not the least, we all understand that the patient's overall health and survival and compliance will gu guide us to what kind of management we need to do. We also need to consider some patient related factors like patients general health expectancy whether it's more than six weeks or, or less if it is l anything less than that we obviously do only conservative management and whether we, we need to ensure that the kind of surgery you are going to do will benefit the patient and, and the benefits will, will weigh far better than the conservative management and the quality of the bone the remaining bone itself per se is pretty good to hold your reconstructions and this kind of surgery will help you to rehabilitate these patients so these factors must be ensured before you take on to any surgical kind of management this is one question which comes up in all mdt's fracture has not happened but do we need to do something before it fractures and that's what called as prophylactic fixation and Merrill's rating system is is a deck decades old system which has stood the test of the time which talks about the site of the lesion the kind of pain patient is having whether the lesion is blastic mixed or lytic and what the size of the lesion in terms of the circumference of the bone and this scoring system tells us that if you have score which is more than nine that means it has a very high susceptibility of getting fracture and must be prophylactically fixed and if the scores are less than seven then you can try conservative management for these patients and this score has been tested multiple times over decades and have stood the test of the time and now is the mainstay to decide about prophylactic fixations when we talk about the fixation we must ensure that we fill these cavities with various agents expecting bone to heal in these patients and hence curatage of the lesions using adjuvants and putting cement becomes the mainstay we also need to ensure that we don't just do the curettage, but we support the bone in a nice way with appropriate implants so that the bone becomes strong enough to bear the weight of the patient and patient can do functional activities as soon as possible. And these are a few examples for the same and I've shown that the recently developed locking plates, the strength of the locking plates is much higher as compared to the usual ancestral plates which doesn't uh, give way and hence these are more popular to it to be used another big question comes to or uh, to the mind of all orthopedic surgeons or in mdt is if you have a fracture in the periarticular or juxtaarticular area should we try to fix it or should we replace it with the prosthesis and the answer is very clear here it depends upon the kind of disease you have if i have a myeloma patient i know that i have a very very high chance of healing of the bone by medical therapy and radiation oncology therapy and hence these patients are more treated conservatively as compared to other uh, other lesions like breast and the lung where the healing of these fractures are extremely extremely low and hence a replacement is preferred in these patients and these are various articles which clearly talks about that especially in the proximal femur if you have a fracture the healing rates are very low even if you put the nails with cement they tend to fail over a period of time and hence replacement better options specifically
lower limb upper limb behaves slightly differently one should also remember that just looking at the fracture is not the right thing to do we must ensure that we scan the entire bone and the lesions in the entire bone should be fixed rather than just having a telescopic vision and fixing only the fractures some common error happens in the management and i would like to highlight it here is some uh, few of the orthopedic surgeons underestimate the life expectancy of the patient and this typically happens in lung cancers where they feel that the prognosis is very poor but we know that now we have various mutations and for them we have the effective treatment available and patients live for years together and hence we must ensure that the operation should be appropriate and it should outlive the life of the patient whatever reconstruction which we are doing we underestimate underestimate the uh, bone biology and hence we must ensure that the construct which we are trying to do the kind of plates we are trying to use the kind of fillers we are trying to use should take the load of the patient's body weight and should help us to mobilize these patients immediately we also under treat the current disease and this is what happens when we treat the disease in isolation and hence an mdt should be there and hence we must ensure that the all lesions in patient's body should be assessed completely and should be treated and appropriate reference to medical and radiation oncology should happens and each lesion should be addressed and the last is not planning for the future disease and and this is where we need to know that by not giving additional radiotherapy can lead to again recurrence of the disease or the progression of the disease and we may be in a disaster and hence we have to use adjuvants wherever required also we need to understand that many times these lesions are very vascular especially when they are in the pelvis and when if you are planning to operate we must ensure that we have adequate infrastructure available to us to support and take the help of our intervention radiology colleagues to embolize these lesions pre operatively so that the, the surgery is more effective and we can have a better outcome a lot of new treatments are, are are available and i'm sure these will be covered by dr kunal gala but these are sort of semi invasive treatments where various ablative therapies along with cementoplasty are quite helpful to heal these regions and 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 to have the better functional outcome uh, and avoiding the major morbid surgery specifically in peri acetabular lesion as you are seeing here uh these are few of the important uh, new uh, uh, things which are coming up like uh, pain palliation by mri guided focus ultrasound or we have hifu available which can help to treat uh, these lesions and cure them with the pain now i'll show you some cases before i and my talk and you will be able to see that how differently you can treat these patients specifically first this patient is a 65 year old lady she had a fall at home and this was the lesion she she came with and when we evaluated her with the help of mri this was the lesion this was the one of the isolated lesions which were there in the liver and 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 uh, and we realized that this patient had a breast cancer earlier which was treated and this biopsy uh, later on found to be an adeno ca and most probably was the lung and so we have three four patients like this where we have the double primaries and then they were treated uh, with mdt in a different way so if you get a lesion like that there are various prognostic scores which which can help you to decide what kind of management or, or what kind of treatment you do and these have various parameters like what is the primary what is the aggressiveness of the disease whether these lesions are only uh, located in the bones or they are in the viscera's what is the ecog status of the patient and what kind of previous treatment patient has taken and based upon that you have the survival curves available and depending upon these survival curves you predict or you you predict the survival and do the appropriate management and this patient to our uh, lung mdt to take care of uh, the the lesions another patient was uh, a 47 year old male who had pain in, in his thighs since long this was the lesion and uh, we e evaluated this further with the help of a ct guided biopsy which came out to be metastatic carcinoma 
on the pet there was primary in the lung with nodes and it was a solitary bony lesion this was the ct scan and this was the lesion in the lung which was picked up on the pet scan again evaluated the patient with the prognostic scores and we found that this patient has better survival this patient was treated with prophylactic fixation with the help of interlocking nail and was treated with adjuvant CTRT and had a fantastic outcome with healing of the lesion. Another patient, 61 year old male who suddenly developed pain in his hip and inability to walk. And this was the lesion of the pelvis where we see the protrusio acetabule where the femur has literally gone inside the pelvis and he was not able to walk. We did the biopsy again. This was uh, an unknown primary. It came as metastatic carcinoma and uh, we followed the usual steps of identifying the primary, looking at the disease burden and obviously then prognosticating the patient and treat the effective limb. The PET scan showed the CA lung with adrenal, nodal and brain metastasis. And obviously we know that the, the treatment which we are looking at must be conservative treatment and should not be embarking on to very aggressive treatment in this patient their prognosis is very poor and hence he was treated with radiotherapy and he's come to the disease after two months another very interesting case of CA lung with skeletal metastasis in a 63 year old male who had CA lung since four years he was treated in Tata Memorial Hospital by Dr. Kumar along the lesser trochanter this was his PET scan earlier where he should show he showed, showed the lesion in the uh, uh, in the femur and this was his biopsy at that point of time he was and he, he had egfr mutations positive and and he was treated uh, with SPRT to the lung and to the femoral region radiotherapy and this was complete resolution of the lesion so again showing you highlighting you that how the management and the outcomes in these patients have changed and over a period of three years these lesions were observed recently i found that the, his, his lesion has increased and he's developed a fracture when dr kumar referred it to me we did the mri again this so the lesion has increased with the pathological fractures and recently we replaced with megaprosthesis so again trying to show that the the kind of surgery the kind of aggressiveness we need to do it all depends upon the biology of the disease and the fitness of the patients so I will end here by saying that we all in metastatic bone patients, we try our level best to cure sometimes and to control most oftenly and comfort always. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Ashish for the wonderful presentation. Questions I think we can take up during the panel discussion. So we'll go for the next talk that is role of interventional radiology radiology for treatment of bone metastasis by Dr. Nal Gala, is Associate Professor of Interventional Radiology at TMH Mumbai. Over to Dr. Kunal, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sir, you can share your slide now, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Just full screen it. I am audible. Yes, sir. You are audible. My slides are visible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would thank the Lung Academy uh, to give uh, give me a role uh, uh, to speak on the role of intervention radiology in management of bone metastasis. So these are the uh, brief headings in which I would be describe, uh, describing. So as Dr. Ashish told, uh, 30 to 40 percent of the patient uh, in lung cancer develop uh, bone metastasis. And these can be either osteolytic, osteogenic or mixed. Uh, and the spine being the most common site of involvement, followed by ribs, ileum, sacrum, and of which the thoracic uh, vertebra is the most common site of involvement. 
so with uh, now improved surgical techniques uh, availability of chemo and radiotherapy as well as immunotherapy the survival of these patients with metastasis has prolonged in uh, carcinoma of lung so coming on to the mechanism of bone metastasis bone uh, metastasis weaken the structural integrity via osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity which leads to collapse of vertebral body or any bone in the body and this leads to vertebral compression fracture or uh, for that matter compression of the pelvic uh, pelvic bones and uh, 30% of bone metastasis will have vertebral compression fracture so the goal in intervention radiology is first to preserve and restore the neurological function to improve the pain control uh, to have improved quality of life and uh, to maintain the spine uh, stability or acetabular stability as as well so a role of intervention radiologist uh, in bony lesion so first and foremost is diagnosis that is biopsy image guided percutaneous biopsy either uh, um, just aspiration or percutaneous biopsy and coming on to the management of bony lesions uh, in vertebra it would be for pain palliation and stabilization for in the form of vertebroplasty kyphoplasty that is balloon insertion and followed by uh, cementoplasty uh, you can combine with ablative therapy like radio frequency microwave or cryoablation along with cementoplasty and in any other part of the body it is called as osteoplasty or acetabuloplasty in acetabulum coming on to the image guided bone biopsy this is a safe effective accurate diagnostic tool as compared to open techniques and the indication in which uh, the biopsy is performed first is to confirm the histological character characterization of the focal bony lesion as dr gulia has already told and the receptor for receptor and immunohistochemist uh, chemical analysis with uh, the advent of newer molecular therapies coming in the receptor and immunohistochemistry is the most important thing and to characterize the fracture that is to differentiate between osteoporotic metastasis versus uh, uh, the uh, versus a metastatic disease or inflammatory origin it, we can do uh, either with uh, the help of ct scan guidance if it is a focal lesion uh, under ct scan guidance if it is uh, if there is a large soft tissue along with the bony lesion it can be done under ultrasound guidance and if whole of the vertebral body is involved uh, it can be done with the fluoroscopy guidance the advantage of fluoroscopy is basically it is much uh, quicker as compared to the ct guided biopsy so another you can combine uh, fluoroscopy with uh, with ct guided biopsy when we are performing c1 c2 biopsy because uh, it gives a real time image as well as we can do on the same table so now let's come on to the some of the spinal lesions so management of uh, spinal metastasis the treatment of spinal metastasis is complex and uh, it has to be done in with multidisciplinary approach and decision of spinal metastasis depends upon nms assessment that is neurological assessment oncological assessment mechanical assessment systemic assessment so neurological assessment is by two methods one is clinical and another is radiographic in clinical uh, 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 we need to assess the myelopathy and uh, radi uh, functional radiculopathy uh, so that uh, the soft tissue involving the uh, the cord on the radio, uh, the epidural uh, spinal com uh, compression needs to be addressed if it is uh, if the soft tissue is less than one third involvement of the uh, epidural space then uh, if uh, vertebroplasty can be easily performed if it is more than uh, one third uh, and compressing the spinal cord and canal and th that becomes contraindication for doing vertebroplasty and uh, that is a uh, indication for urgent spinal decompression so uh, uh, we, uh, we can combine uh, two techniques like ablation with cementoplasty uh, when uh, there is a soft tissue involving uh, more than one third uh, the soft uh, soft tissue but less than 2/3 and the spinal uh, cord is not involved uh, combining heat based ablation therapy like radio frequency ablation uh, or a uh, microwave ablation where electromagnetic uh, waves are used Com uh, can combine with cryoablation where the ice formation is there and laser ablation and hifu uh, which is recently come up 
so there are various types of pain which are there one uh, we need to assess regarding the uh, pain uh, whether it is a radicular pain versus a axial pain if uh, it is due to the pressure symptoms and it is involving the nerve roots the management would be radiation uh, chemotherapy and uh, steroids so steroids can be either per oral or uh, intra uh, lesional or intra articular uh, so this was a patient where the patient had a focal lesion and patient had significant pain and uh, this is how the ct guided uh, approach we had used uh, for the, uh, injecting steroids and thus patient is relieved of pain uh, another type of pain is due to compressive fracture or uh, spinal instability so where the management is either open surgery or percutaneous augmentation Uh, so open surgery is uh, morbid and percutaneous uh, ablation is uh, uh, the day care procedure coming on to the pain score uh, the pain score is generally evaluated uh, with uh, a visual analog score uh, pain uh, pain sc uh, visual analog scale of uh, 0 to 10 where 1 being no pain and 10 being excruciating pain which needs to be assessed another feature which needs to be assessed is oncological assessment that is histology sensitivity of radiation therapy subtype of uh, ca lung uh, whether it is a palliative intent or a curative uh, intent mechanical assessment needs to be done with uh, spinal uh, instability neoplastic score uh, where uh, one needs to address location of the lesion pain bony lesion uh, radiographic spinal alignment vertebral collapse and posterolateral elements of the spine and the score which we get uh, needs to be addressed uh, uh, so when it is intermediate that is 7 to 12 uh, that is the time when we perform a vertebroplasty and if it is unstable uh, that that is the time when it uh, goes for urgent spinal decompression another thing which needs to assess in noms is a systemic assessment uh, that is a patient comorbidity overall disease burden and ability to withstand the procedure and patient needs to continue systemic therapy and uh, uh, other other procedures so coming on to the indication of percutaneous augmentation that is a combination either uh, with only vertebroplasty or vertebroplasty with kyphoplasty um, uh, uh, the indication is for painful vertebra as due to extensive osteolysis due to malignant infiltration by metastasis Uh, or multiple myeloma or lymphoma uh, uh, stabilization of vertebra as in case of uh, mets and myeloma we can do combination therapy that is ablation uh, along with vertebroplasty when there is a soft tissue which is present so that there is uniform distribution of the cement which is present and uh, the compression fracture is defined as less than 20% uh, decrease in the vertebral height or more than 4 mm decrease in the vertebral height so uh, percutaneous uh, uh, augmentation can be performed either with a vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty so the main aim here is to consolidate the fracture to increase the height uh, of the vertebra and for pain palliation Uh, coming on to the contraindication so there are certain contraindication like bleeding disorder when there is retropulsion of the fracture fragments uh, so uh, here there is more than 70% reduction in the vertebral body height and uh, when uh, there is ongoing systemic infection or patient is allergic to cement uh, that is a time when these are contraindication when the patient uh, had a significant uh, uh, spinal canal stenosis or uh, uh, or arthropathy uh, along the spine those are rel uh, relative contraindication or when that there is tumor extension into the vertebral canal or there is a cord compression so these are relative uh, compression so let's go on to discuss a few of the cases so uh, this was a, a case of ca lung with vertebral metastasis a metastasis at d6 and d8 level where the patient had a pain score of 7 by 10 and was on uh, two opioid medication uh, the mri reveals uh, d6 and d8 vertebral uh, collapse however the cord, uh, cord signal changes were not present since the patient had significant amount of pain vertebroplasty was done at uh, two levels uh, where we uh, see post uh, cement injection there is good distribution of the cement and it also fills the crevices uh, of the cement and post that uh, uh, the post procedure patient had a uh, um, 
uh, pain score of two by uh, two by ten, and patient is off opioid analgesic, which is a great thing uh, for the patient. Uh, so, uh, com uh, when when do we use a combination therapy? So, this is a case of CA lung uh, with a, a wedge compression fracture at the L3 vertebra. What we see here is a soft tissue along with the lytic uh, vertebral lesion. There is decrease in the height of the vertebra and uh, a bipedicular approach is taken uh, followed by ablation of uh, this uh, soft tissue and <coughs> after ablation, we injected a cement and the uh, injection of cement is uniform and distribution is uniform. The pain which was 6 by 10 reduced to 2 by 10 post procedure. And this is another patient where uh, we had performed for pain uh, reduction uh, as well as there is a soft tissue. So uh, the RF ablation was performed along with cementoplasty and the pain score which was 7 by 10 uh, reduced to 3 by 10. So coming on to the response assessment, the pain relief in malignant fracture occurs in around 60 to 85%, whereas in acute osteoporotic fracture, it, uh, the response assessment after vertebroplasty is around 90%. So there are certain, coming on to the review of literature, there are certain literature like uh, this is a randomized control trial which uh, studied at safety and efficacy of vertebral augmentation with non-surgical techniques. And here they use uh, Ronald Morrison disability questionnaire where at one month interval, there was significant decrease uh, which was statistically significant as compared to the control group. And uh, this study suggested that uh, vertebroplasty, uh, vertebral augmentation is safe and effective and this was published in Lancet Oncology. This was another large prospective study of 128 patients uh, with spinal, meta, uh, spinal malignancy and out of which 87 were for spinal metastasis. So visual analog score decreased from 7.5 to 4.7 and uh, after percutaneous vertebroplasty and this was statistically significant and thus it improves uh, this. This is one of the meta-analysis of uh, 180 uh, articles where seven studies were included and vertebral augmentation was compared uh, with uh, other uh, alone as well as with uh, other uh, other uh, adjacent features like chemotherapy, uh, uh, steroid injection, and uh, where vertebroplasty was done, the pain severity uh, reduced from uh, uh, reduced to zero from five point one. So thus, in all the studies, it has been shown that uh, there is significant uh, decrease in the pain score. Uh, when uh, vertebroplasty was compared with kyphoplasty, uh, so there was no significant increase uh, uh, advantage of kyphoplasty because uh, the pain reduction, uh, height uh, recovery, and post-operative complications were same as with vertebroplasty. However, the cost of kyphoplasty was 2.5 times more than the vertebroplasty. Uh, However, kyphoplasty can be used in severe kyphotic angle and when there are multiple wedge fractures. When do we combine with radiofrequency ablation? So what additional advantage do we have? It destroys the tumor, that is one. It, dis it, it thrombos the paravertebral and intervertebral venous plexuses and thus it minimizes the uh, cement leakage. Uh, uh, cement uh, is more uniformly distributed along the vertebral body and uh, the chances of cement in, uh, into the canal is uh, com very, very less as compared to just uh, uh, vertebroplasty. And uh, the pain score decreases from 8.6 to 2.6 and thus it is said that RFA combined with vert vertebroplasty uh, is safe and effective. So another procedure that uh, can be performed is sacroplasty when the patient is having a uh, carcinoma of lung uh, uh, and spinal metastasis, patient has already been irradiated uh, and uh, now has developed a sacral insufficiency fracture. That is the time uh, when uh, 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 sacroplasty can be performed and uh, this is how uh, sacroplasty was performed uh, along the biped uh, bipedicular and cement was injected into the uh, the S1 vertebral body and along uh, the insufficiency fractures. And the post uh, procedure patient has reduction of pain from 8 by 10 to 3 by 10. 
coming on to the acetabuloplasty so uh, here the indication of acetabuloplasty is generally to uh, when uh, the patient is having a bone metastasis along with soft tissue which is present and this was a 43 year old female diagnosed with ca lung and had bone and liver lesion a patient developed uh, limping of gait and uh, was walking with support a patient had a pain score of 9 by 10 and msts of around 10 by 30 and uh, here uh, on ct scan uh, there was a lytic uh, lesion in the supra acetabular uh, uh, region and patient had uh, a limping of gait and uh, imbalance so here uh, we had performed rf ablation uh, uh, along with cementoplasty and creation of a, a acetab <laughs> new new acetabulum and thus uh, after acetabuloplasty the pain score reduced to 3 by 10 which was 7 by 10 and msts improved to 24 by 30 and thus there is good distribution of the cement along the acetabular roof this is another patient where patient had a, a metastatic disease along the acetabulum rfa along with acetabuloplasty was performed and uh, pain score reduced from 9 by 10 to 3 by 10 uh, 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 which uh, uh, with just cement impla- in, in, uh, injection coming on to the uh, review of literature uh this is a meta analysis uh, of 30 articles uh, which reviewed at uh, 652 patients and 761 lesions of the size 4.5 uh, where the uh, maximum patients were of pelvis and uh, another was a long bone cementoplasty was done in 60% of the cases while rest was combination therapy like ablation with cementoplasty or implant with cementoplasty and the pain reduction ranges from 3.3 uh, point uh, which was 3.2 to 9.5 reduced to 0.5 to uh, 5.6 so in conclusion uh, intervention radiologists play a vital role in overall diagnosis in and management of bony metastasis uh, in combination with uh, a radiation oncologist surgical oncologist and uh, a medical oncologist pain score reduction with vertebroplasty acetabuloplasty and cementoplasty improvement in sin score for vertebral uh, stabilization and msts score for <coughs> extremity uh, or acetabuloplasty and uh, thank you thank you dr kunal for the very comprehensive presentation when multiple modalities are available like for the ablative therapy how will you select one over the other Uh, so uh, it depends like what modalities you are available uh, having uh, so first and foremost it, uh, it is a cryoablation cryoablation can be done in the local uh, local local uh, locally uh, you do not require a general anesthesia or deep sedation because uh, it does not cause much pain whereas rfa causes a mild uh, a mild to increase pain depending on the pa- uh, patient's capacity so cryoablation is the first prefer followed by uh, and recently motion trial has also shown that pain uh, palliation with uh, cryoablation is much better uh, as compared to rf and microwave thank you now i invite uh, dr jp agarwal the professor and head of department of radiation oncology tmh to take over for the next session thank you arun and thank you other organizers for inviting me uh, certainly bone metastasis is a very integral part of the practice of any radiation oncologist uh, it is probably the least invasive but important thing is how rapidly we can bring about the patient which is pain free and improve the quality of life and also control the disease at the same time so i invite gagan a close friend to share his thoughts on the role of radiation therapy in bony metastases special reference to lung cancer gagan stage is yours thank you sir it's a pleasure to be welcomed by you uh, thank you dr arun for having me here starting to share my screen yes sir you can share So, so yeah. So the so the mandate given to me is about role of radiation therapy for bony metastasis from lung cancer. 
and uh, so we know that uh, it's a very common problem and 80% of patients with solid tumors can develop bone metastasis due to the course of illness and uh, studies have shown that 25 to 50% patients with lung cancer will also have bone metastasis uh, sounds incredible uh, sometimes we feel it could be more but this is what i found in the studies uh, so the goal of palliative treatment of bone metastasis are pain relief, preservation of function and maintenance of skeletal integrity as Dr. Kate just now pointed out that that is the main point. We are primarily trying to do palliation. So the initial evaluation has been touched upon by all the speakers before. So just quickly go through it. Site of pain should be seen, severity, associated neuropathic component, correlation with imaging should be made, uh, especially since we are going to plan a intervention with radiation. And spinal instability score should be certainly kept in mind. You can, you know, keep this score under the class of your table or something like that. You know, it's very difficult to remember. So that's where we keep it on, or on this uh, board somewhere. And order imaging if you think there is a need for it. So what is happening inside the bone? So the tumor is basically activating the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts in various immune and inflammatory mediated pathways. And that's leading to all the pain. When we use RT for pain relief, so what is, so, so, so this, in this session, we'll discuss uh, how RT is helping for pain relief and various aspects thereof. So before I go ahead, I will just give you this image, which is like, which will, should work like a mental picture of what is actually being done when we are doing this palliative standard RT. So this is the area we have marked the entire vertebra and we have you know, focused it with three beams and we have given it a certain dose. So this is what is the palliative RT. So you guys may be used to very focused radiation therapy plans, which are there in almost each and every aspect of radiation oncology practice these days. But for the bone metastasis, this is the standard palliative radiotherapy. And so this palliative radiotherapy inhibits the stromal cells, the osteoclast, osteoblast, the immune cells, and also uh, works on the cancer cells. So the effect is multi-pronged. Radiation therapy has a multi-pronged effect. And this is probably the reason why many patients can get relief in the beginning only in 24 hours. So contrary to what we imagine, uh, radiation is not just inhibiting, radiation is not just inhibiting the proliferation of cancer cells and decreasing it, leading to benefit. It's also working on various other mechanisms as well. So what is the standard schedule of radiation? It's an unresolved issue in the sense that there are many uh, bits of information. So these are the, some of the uh, schedules that we uh, may or may not know about. This is a very single fraction. These are SPRT schedules. You're giving a very high dose in single fraction or this relatively high dose in relatively fewer fractions or the standard 20 and 5 and 30 and 10. So th these two and this is the standard palliative regimen. So what is better? Well, we would imagine more is better. Uh, this uh, earliest paper, 1999, uh, randomized between 8 way single fraction and uh, multi fraction regimens, 20 and 5 and 30 and 10. This is a very interesting paper because it does not have any authors. It's probably the only time I've ever seen this. This is on the behalf of Bone Pain Trial Working Party. This is a randomized paper, very quality paper. It has defined the practice in radiation oncology. So they randomized patients and they recorded the pain severity score, not just immediately at two weeks and one month, but also at every month thereof, up to 12 months, very high quality data. And they showed that the probability of pain relief was same with both the regimens, whether you give single or you give multi-fraction. And the probability of being uh, in no pain, you know, not everybody's going to get a complete pain relief, just certain, many patients, the benefit is that your analgesics become better, uh, you know, they work better. But even that is not making becoming any better with the multi uh, fractions. But yes, uh, when you are using single fraction, the chance of retreatment is high, and with multiple fractions, chance of retreatment is less. So this is definitely one uh, uh, thing which uh, uh, which which was found in this trial, apart from the other things. So many such trials came in, and I'll just uh, take you through the uh, systematic review. And in this systematic review, again, they showed that the retreatment was you know, lesser with the multiple uh, uh, fractions. And this was statistically significant. You can see the rhomboid is far side of unity. Uh, so there is a preference of multiple fraction when longer survival is expected to avoid retreatment. Then this, uh, the, 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 this result of overall response rates, it's you know, a little bit on the left side of the unities, 
stretching unity, but it's statistically significant. Uh, so now you zoom it in. So uh, so what you do is, uh, so what we do clinically and empirically is that we, uh, we understand that when there is a higher overall response rate, there is an implication of uh, uh, for, for the tumors with soft tissue extension uh, to prevent the skeletal related events. So there is a preference in practice of multiple fraction when there is soft tissue extension in bone metastasis. We come to spinal cord compression, the role of RT there. So this is the Patchell paper. Patchell paper randomized, uh, the Patchell randomized uh, surgery followed by RT for the spinal cord compression to RT alone. And they found that uh, there was a statistically significant benefit in the ambulation. Um, and this was all statistically significant in various scores. So uh, unfortunately, not all papers after this has shown this benefit. And uh, there is a lot of discussion about uh, standardization. Not everybody has very good uh, ortho surgeons, uh, but regardless, uh, uh, you know, this uh, when available would probably be much, much beneficial. So surgery followed by RT, uh, multiple fraction is preferable to RT alone. So does RT alone help in spinal cord compression? Well, it does help. It does help in some patients. And uh, the again, the go-to thought will be that a higher dose or a multiple fractions would probably be better. Again, you know, we're in for a a uh, little bit of a surprise that there was no benefit when you compare the five treatment regimens of single fraction, 20 and 5, 13, 10, and so on and so forth. To, uh, you know, in respect to improvement of motor function, with respect to no change in motor function, with respect to ambulation, and these are uh, the same results tabulated. But there was some benefit uh, in terms of freedom from infield recurrences when there was a uh, difference, uh, when, when, when more number of fractions was compared with less number of fractions and less doses. So maybe uh, for patients unsuitable for surgery, uh, we could uh, you know, use uh, lesser number of fractions with patients with poorer survival, but for patients with uh, uh, you know, uh, relatively better biology, uh, they're, they're likely to receive longer uh, survival, we could probably schedule uh, longer fractions. So what are the expectations from uh, RT for pain relief, for the palliative RT, the section that we are in, the discussion that we've been doing? Rates of pain relief, 50 to 85%, complete response up to one third. Complete to partial pain relief within four weeks of RT, we can expect. Mean duration of remission, approximately 19 weeks. I've not mentioned the reference, there is a reference to it. Duration is smaller for aggressive tumors like CA lung. Uh, yeah. So this, this table from one, one of these papers presented previously shows that there is a higher rate of retreatment with CLM. So there are some side effects in toxicity. Nausea is there, lethargy, diarrhea, skin reactions. But the, but more than grade two reactions are less than 10%. So relatively well tolerated, quite well tolerated. It's not the reason to not give this treatment. Pain flare can be seen uh, in two to 40% patients and can be avoided in patients on steroids and NSAIDs. So this is what we've been discussing till now. We've been discussing a standard RT plan, this is the palliative RT. This is what we use for palliation of bony metastasis as in improving in symptomatology for bony metastasis, especially pain. So we come to what SBRT in bony metastasis. Now, what is SBRT? So I'm sure all of my colleagues sitting here are oncologists, but just for the sake of posterity, uh, you know, this is the, uh, the metastasis in the vertebra. SBRT would be something like this. We would like to carve the dose around the spinal cord like this, and we would, you know, fill up the dose like this within the within the vertebra. So it is a very precise distribution with a very high dose per fraction, and it should be delivered under full image guidance. That's what is required. So what is the role of SBRT? Now this is now here. Before we were discussing, you know, single fraction, and you know, just the whole vertebra is as good in so many ways. And now we have come to SBRT. So let's start right away that where does SBRT fit in for the palliation of bony metastasis? This is the astro evidence based guidelines. So the main indications for SBRT insofar as palliation is concerned is persistent bony metastasis and recurrent bone pain. So basically for retreat. But there is a lot of nuance and a lot of benefit when you have a beautiful technology like SBRT. To begin with, as you can see what just popped in into my screen down below, you will see that uh, I've written that SBRT is relevant for patients with treatment for, with, for, for relatively radio-resistant neoplasms. So these are relatively radio-resistant neoplasms, renal cell cancers, melanomas, and sarcomas. These are 
very radio resistance. They have a very low alpha by beta ratio. So you give very high dose per fraction, more number of times, uh, the benefit is much more likely. What about SBRT for bone mats in lung cancer for oligometastatic or for oligometastatic state? So oligometastasis we know is a clinical state. It is not just counting the number of metastases, something that we all sometimes do, but it's a clinical state because you just not only need to have a limited number of mats, you also need to have an indolent biology or a biology which is in control of the, of the systemic therapy. However, the treatment of oligometastasis is not new. It has been tried since many, many decades now. And in 1995, uh, uh, with, with this JCO uh, edition, uh, with, with this JCO publication, it came in the mainstream of oncology. So if you see the clinical spectrum, there is one side is a localized disease and other side is metastatic disease. Oligometastasis is somewhere intermediate. There are different clinical scenarios. You could have oligomets at the time of diagnosis. You could have oligometastasis or you know some areas which are not eradicated after systemic treatment or there is an oligo recurrence after the full treatment. There is a couple of sites which have developed again or oligo progression. You know, the patient is on palliative treatment, but then there is a progression at one site or two sites or three sites. But then the other aspects of indolent or comfortable biology are also there. Uh, regardless, uh, uh, the, the, this biology part is not really under the scope of this discussion today. So uh, we move to uh, the benefit of uh, RT with, in, in lung cancer, oligometastasis. So, the, so this is a peculiar uh, disease, lung cancer, where up to 50% can have oligometastasis. You know, there's a couple of reports which uh, show us which report this. So this is a very important aspect to understand for lung cancer practitioners. So we come to uh, the question that does ablative SPRT help in oligomets in lung cancer? Oligomets are not oligomets. Oligomets in lung cancer. So this is the saber comet trial, the phase two randomized trial. And this is a very nice phase two paper and they published it in Lancet 2019. And they showed that while numerically the number of patients surviving overall was superior than control, but it was not statistically significant. And so was the case with the progression. Uh, no, no, progression-free survival was superior statistically. This is a very interesting slide. I've just made it actually when after logging in into this paper. This is the extended long-term outcomes of the same Saber Comet trial, which I just presented, which was published yesterday, May 25th, 2022. May 26th is today. So what they report today is I couldn't get the get hold of the full paper that the eight-year overall survival is statistically significantly superior when you are using SABER. SABER is basically stereotactic ablative body RT. It's another term for SPRT. It's the same thing. Uh, radiation oncology has a lot of these terminologies. They, are, they, they evolve uh, because of different usage in different countries for different billing and uh, insurance purposes. So uh, eight-year overall survival is statistically significant and progression-free survival indeed remains statistically significant. So, uh, so, so from today onwards, perhaps we can say that for oligometastatic lung cancer, we can think about SABR or SBRT for, all, for oligometastasis, you know, with other considerations. Uh, so what is actually happening? So this was nicely summarized by Putman's in Lancet 2014. This was for breast cancer. But if on this side, we plot the decreasing risk of distant metastasis with increasing effectiveness of systemic therapy, the theoretical benefit of RT improves. So as the benefit of systemic therapy improves, the benefit of RT improves because it is taking care of the residual uh, clones which could be resistant. Of course, the benefit of RT become, starts becoming lesser when the, the systemic therapy is even more effective. Now, up to here, we see in breast cancer with very nice hormonal therapies which are there in breast cancer, uh, we are all oncologists here. I'm sure we can understand uh, natural uh, uh, examples. This we see in prostate cancer and hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, where we don't need to give any uh, radiotherapy to the bone metastasis. So, uh, so, so as the benefit of systemic therapy improves, the benefit of local RT also improves. Also, for oligometastasis, there is a special consideration. This is a graph that was published in the Red Journal recently. I'm just zooming it. If this black line is the natural cell curve of the disease, and this is where an event happens, if you treat it early, this line moves significantly away from this time point to this time point. So this is the benefit of doing, say, radiotherapy for oligometastasis. 
Uh, as you go further and further away, as the number of cells continues to increase, the benefit becomes lesser and lesser. And sometimes it is not clinically perceptible. So uh, this is uh, proven well with the Sabre Comet trial. So what about SBRT after spinal decompression? So we saw the Paschal paper. We, 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 we saw that 30 in 10 is to be done after this. And there are multiple papers otherwise also. And uh, so the benefit you can say with conventional post of RT that 20 in 5 or 13 in 10, 13 in 10 is what is preferred, uh, is about 50 to 79 percent with an ambulatory rate of around 80 percent. But if you do SBRT, that is high dose per fraction to the residual tumor after surgery, you can get a local control of up to 100 percent with a good, with a very high ambulatory control and a long term pain control. So this is a very desirable outcome. This is, you know, compare it with the conventional RT. Go to the next table. I, you know, similar data, and you compare it with the conventional RT. So this is very exciting because now, uh, because of the, I think, you know, Dr. Bulia, if he's around, he can, you know, perhaps uh, chip in later. That um, the revised goal of surgery in SBRT era can be discussed now. This, this term ben, was uh, separation surgery has been coined by Benzil and Angelov. And what they are saying is that you separate the soft tissue, which is causing the spinal cord compression away from the spinal cord. And that is where you get the benefit of epidural decompression by laminectomy. And with that, you remove the tumor away from the spinal cord and you can get a very good dose to the tumor. And, you know, uh, we, we get a very good local control and we've also gotten some benefit with surgery. So that is, you know, you could say the current status. So this, some, some papers, uh, this is a separation surgery paper and you know, this is what they've done. So you can see this is what they've done. They have, you know, we could say, we, the, the, the authors have been able to, we, are, we also do it ourselves. Right now we are treating one of the patients like this. So this is the spinal cord and here is the large soft tissue. So you, could, you know, when you did the surgery, you, you just made sure that this part that was touching the spinal cord has moved away so that you could give a good dose. And it is indeed statistically significantly better when you're doing this. This is what I would like to share. So we can use it empirically for patients expected to have a long survival. Of course, it would be long survival. That's why you're considering surgery. And you would maximize local control and ambulation. So I'm concluding now. A uh, single fraction should be given for expected short-term survival for palliation of pain from lung cancer metastasis, multiple fractions for expected longer-term survival. Nowadays, lung cancer has a lot of long-term survivals, with, uh, with especially the, uh, the targeted therapy uh, in the adenocarcinomas and uh, definitely with the immunotherapy now. Uh, in fact, I have not mentioned it, but the benefit of uh, radiation therapy with immunotherapy is that of immune modulation. So coming to the third point, SBRT provides superior local control and is more relevant in radiological histologies. Benefit with SBRT can prolong progression-free survival in oligometastatic lung cancer. Adjuvant RT after surgery is important to maintain ambulation. Adjuvant RT with SBRT after surgery will provide a superior local control, which can benefit patients and can have a longer survival. I, I thank Dr. Arun and the organizers. I thank you for having me here. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you, Professor JP. Thanks Thank you. for sharing your thoughts from conventional to extremely high dose, confined doses of SBRT. I think there will be some definitely questions and Sushant can take them up in a panel discussion, which is very illustrious panel discussion. I request Sushant to please uh, take over and for the panel discussion. Just for some questions to begin with, which are the areas of bone? I think we will, as a radiation oncologist, we say, okay, don't need to treat now. We'll have a look. Or is there is any differential dose between an osteoporotic met versus a sclerotic met? And all those things, I think those things will come up in a panel discussion. Sushant, stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's nice hearing you after such a long time, sir. And uh, thank you, Dr. Arun Gupta, sir, for inviting me for um, moderating this panel discussion. I'll just share my screen.
sir just a minute uh, dr govind babu sir and dr ashish gulia sir won't be joining sir so i request dr gagan saini to join the panel sir, if possible for you and even dr kunal gala okay so we have dr arun sir dr pankaj dr anil hi anil how are you yeah i'm good sashant and rest of the two panelists so i'll start sharing my screen now yes sir team yes sir you can share now sir <coughs> So thank you. I'll just start. Uh, hi, Pankaj. Hi. How are you? Good, good, good. So we have a great. We had a great discussion today about various bone metastases present in two hundred and six bones. What are what what where all the possible mets can be there and how to manage. And uh, as one of the statements by Dr. Gagan was very well said that all of us don't have. Uh, access to a dedicated ortho oncologist so we do uh, have those challenges in our setting we do, we are not as lucky as uh, as cmh or or aims who have dedicated uh, ortho oncologist with them so <clears throat> with that so i'll i'll start with in non metastatic stages what do you consider a high risk for osteoporotic factors so dr pankaj in non metastatic stages what all factors do you consider when i think the uh, main thing is the usage of this steroids and uh, underweight and um, uh, lean bo body mass history of fractures uh, previously then alcohol smoking and um, uh, other factors you have enumerated like this uh, hypogonadism and uh, impaired mobility so these are the various factors uh, various factors we consider uh, to have a patient for high risk of osteoporotic factors so along with this whenever the patient has a stage 4 disease definitely the risk factors almost double or triple because they have the tendency of having uh, bony mets anywhere along the body so now i'll ask dr anil so what factors do you, does influence in decision making Uh, in your opd practice so number of lesion does it affect your decision making as which patients to be treated which not to be treated or bone targeted therapies need to be given uh, so if you are asking about um, the number of lesion i don't think so the local therapy will depend upon the number of lesion but obviously uh, is there any presence of lytic lesion the soft tissue and how much the patient is symptomatic from any of the vertebral side or or the non vertebral side that will be most uh, yeah, important rather than the number of lesion many a time the patient can have multiple lesion but the patient can remain asymptomatic so i don't think so that the number of lesion will be important for the bone uh, specific therapy however it depends if you want to involve the nuclear medicine guys if the patient is symptomatic and have multiple lesions then it's a different thing fine so so number of lesions will not depend so basically if you have even one lesion then also you will give bisphosphonates or or the uh, denosumab or if they have multiple bony lesion then also you will give uh, the this bone modifying agents but i think yes. the urgency of treatment would depend on that because if this one subtle lesion maybe will not give that much importance and after evaluating whenever the patient gets a admission in routine then we will uh, give the injection however there are multiple lesions possibly on the first visit i'll try to give the injection so that at least the rapidity of response would depend on that so dr arun sir yeah sir what i want to know the site of bone lesions so when do you want the oncologist on which site of the bony lesions you want the oncologist to refer the patient to you is it is it the trochanteric subtrochanteric is this the vertebra or the or, or which area when do you want the oncologist to refer the patient so that you can intervene at the correct time and a good palliation can be achieved sir so uh, i would say the any of the separate palliation sort of it all depends on the various various factors 
how the the patient has presented acutely let's say for example the uh, the vertebral acute compression fracture so these these are the best patient who require possibly immediate relief and uh, as the rest of the modalities may take some time to give the patient a uh, comfort mm -hmm. so in those cases uh, the ir techniques like vertebroplasty are the are the best uh, the where ir procedures will be best placed so rest uh, like 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 some soft tissue and all then you have to take a take a call that which modality maybe maybe uh, the radiation or surgical they are so at, i would say the the vertebra is one site where if there is acute pain then uh, we have the best person to help the patients so so dr dagan if the patient has suppose d4 vertebral lesion he has pain and a soft tissue lesion and so what do you want the medical oncologist to do he should send the patient first to the radiation oncologist for treating the soft tissue area and for decreasing the pain or should he send to the intervention radiologist for kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty how does how does the uh, medical oncologist or the surgical oncologist take that decision so at what stage you want us to refer the patient and to whom uh, yeah dr sushant uh, uh, of course uh, we are talking about uh, creating a differentiation of referral between vertebroplasty versus radiotherapy that is the uh, that is the premise of the question so uh, first things first when there is a soft tissue extension uh, the benefit of vertebroplasty becomes less and less vertebroplasty will be beneficial when there is a, when there is some sort of a compression or some some sort of a compression fracture as a result of say metastasis in the body of the vertebra generally the soft tissue when it happens the lateral processes are are involved and uh, that probably is not a very good uh, uh, case for vertebroplasty uh, but of course you know uh, each case is different you know we are talking out of a in a hypothetical scenario there would definitely be some benefit somewhere which can be uh, localized uh, so so this is one situation that maybe vertebroplasty will not be of much help uh, it is interesting to note that very limited studies are there but there was one chinese study where they tried to compare vertebroplasty followed by rt versus rt i do not mention it because there was a lot to mention in my uh, uh, in, in my paper any in my in my discourse anyway so uh, there was no difference in the terms of pain relief but then vertebroplasty is not just about pain relief it's also about structural integrity so there will be some benefit sometimes with definitely with vertebroplasty but to answer your question if there is soft tissue extension and pain i would like you to refer the patient to the radiation oncologist so that the first pain relief can happen fine so I, uh, arun sir uh, do we take... so i have some some difference of opinion with yes, sir. yes sir yes, usual uh... sir usual aapke sath to maza aata hai so it is uh, a clear message that has gone by a word that if a patient have a soft tissue lytic lesion then the vertebroplasty is uh, is not going to benefit i completely disagree with that see in fact the lytic lesions are the are the best lesions uh, for doing the vertebroplasty kunal if you want to comment because you do a lot of vertebroplasty yeah so dr kunal if you are there please please guide the medical oncologist like me and pankaj when they have the patient so whom do we refer do we refer to the radiation oncologist do we refer to the spinal surgeon do we refer to the interventional radiologist that's why i have put all these names in the dmg so dr kunal if you are yeah there. yeah uh, so first and foremost if there is a soft tissue we can do uh, ablation followed by cementoplasty or uh, vertebroplasty and uh, we can reduce the acute pain instantaneously sorry i will just into ablation you what do you mean by ablation R, rfa or cryo ablation or microwave ablation depending on uh, the what modality is available we burn the tumor we create a space and then inject a cement so that will cause a structural integrity as well and if there is acute pain relief uh, with vertebroplasty is much higher than with radiation radiation has a effect uh, over a weeks to uh, months uh, for having the effect as compared to uh, uh, intervention uh, intervention radiology which is instantaneous almost uh, less, uh, less a few days so if if i, so I want to my... rephrase if the patient has impending spinal cord compression so then it is a surgery 
impending then it would be a surgery yeah if there's a, if there is Less a soft tissue not... component which is not impending on the spinal cord yeah. and the pain is there and soft tissue component you would like to ablate and then do a kyphoplasty and, and or... followed by radiation and followed by radiation yeah. so dr so anil think... would you agree sir sorry sir sorry please carry Take, on, just a second just a yeah. second to yeah. summarize this the thing is that the, if the pain score the vas score is reaching like 8 or 9 then i think one should give the benefit of uh, uh, the vertebroplasty in uh, spinal meds patients. If the score is, I would say, five or six, possibly, uh, because uh, the better tumor control would be with uh, radiation as compared to ablation and vertebroplasty. So, uh, like, was score like five, six, I would, I would prefer sending it for the radiation. Uh, if I, I may add, actually, uh, there are certain parameters on the basis of which it is decided whether surgical intervention is required. Like the uh, uh, depth of the bone which is involved, then also whether the mobile part or immobile part of the spinal cord is involved. Then the number of facets which are involved, <coughs> acute, how acute the presentation is, whether the neurological deficit is just going to happen or not. So there are various factors uh, on which basis of which it is decided whether the patient go for surgical intervention or non-surgical and also the longevity of the patient. So longevity... <laughs> Site of spinal cord, extent of involvement, number of facets involved, all these factors are important. So, Dr. Anil, would you agree or you want to add something? No, uh, I want to add something here. Uh, there is no head to head comparison that we are aware of the recent head to head comparison between uh, the intervention of radiology, like Kaiper, the vertebroplasty versus the RT. However, I bet to defer the the immediate response of the radiation therapy is not in the month of seven days or month. You can expect the response by the beam of external beam radiation therapy. If you give SBRT, it can be as early as one or two days. Even with the soft tissue, the radiation therapy will give you a better and durable local control as well as the durable pain relief. So if you see uh, the various new uh, uh, randomized control trial by Dr. Segal, where they have delivered the SBRT in any of the sites with the soft tissue, with no soft tissue, with the lytic metastasis, the duration of the pain relief is close to six to eight months. And the pain response, the complete pain response is close to 40%. So here we should not debate about, uh, uh, about the choice between the interventional radiology versus the radiation oncology. Uh, it's about you know, individual case scenario. If, uh, for example, you know, EBRT has you know, EBRT has certain advantages. It is non-invasive, pain-free. Okay, so these are the two most uh, you know, advantages of the of the external beam radiation therapy. Obviously, if the if the vertebral height is less, if the, if the vertebral collapse, obviously interventional you know, radiology will help in a much better way than the external beam radiation therapy. So I think we should take a balanced view and we should take an individual decision. So if I may make a comment, uh, Dr. Sushant, yes, sir. that, yes, uh, gee, that the, the spinals, the, the score that Dr. Pankaj, you know, has mentioned, it was there in almost everybody's slides, I think, that uh, it's, it's about spinal stability. So the, this is a separate matter. Soft tissue causing pain is a separate matter. Vertebral collapse is a separate matter, and spinal cord compression is a separate matter. These are slightly different aspects of bony metastasis. So, if you have a vertebral collapse, vertebroplasty is good, and if it is causing pain, the pain relief is great. If there is soft tissue, I beg to disagree with Dr. Gala that you know your whatever your uh, ablation is going to be there is not going to work that well because the soft tissue is not just in one place and that area of neural complex is very com is, that neural area is very complex there is a lot of diffuse infiltration you won't be able to ablate you will have to send the patient for radiation each and every study with vertebroplasty has been followed up by followed up by radiation yes they have studied the pain relief and all but then eventually patients have gotten radiation please as dr Tiblewal has said the benefit of radiation is very 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 quick and is very highly time tested it's been 50, more than 50 years radiation therapy is being used for palliation of bony metastasis. And we all have extensive experience. Nobody is waiting for four weeks for pain relief. Maybe the patients come to the, uh, come to the interventional radiologist in that way. Those patients are coming. So maybe that is why this, bunch of, this 
this uh, this island of experience is happening. But in general practice, the benefit occurs quite quickly. Uh, if I'm doing 10 fraction radiation, by fourth or fifth fraction, the patient is telling me that the benefit has started. Yes, at least in 25 to 50% patients, if not in all. So, but yes, if the spine is not stable, spinal stability is paramount because no matter what you do, you will get one fracture or the other. So that is a separate aspect to be fixed. I, I hope I'm making sense here. I hope I'm, uh, you know, uh, addressing the uh, all the aspects in a very objective manner. So radiation therapy is very important. Vertebroplasty is very important. And, uh, you know, certainly surgery is very important. Decompressive surgery is questionable uh, in the absence of a very trained and a, a surgical, uh, you know, or to Fine. What is the um, message we are trying to give that we need to discuss in the DMG and then yes, decide course. what is best for the patient, the neurosurgeon, the spine surgeon, the interventional radiologist, all have to be there and then decide whether the surgery followed by radiation, whether the kyphoplasty followed by radiation or radiation upfront water is to be done, has to be done in keeping the good faith for the patient. So now the next question what I'm asking, like Dr. Agarwal had mentioned, in which scenario we would not like to treat the bone meds? So I'll give you a scenario. We have a patient who has headache, persistent headache, CA lung patient, and we did an MRI. And it showed that there was a dural bone met, which was on the parietal bone, which was causing the pain. So, would we like to treat with by radiation or would we like to just do a medical management in such patients? So, Dr. Anil, what is your take on such patients? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, Sushant, it's a very nice scenario about the dural parietal bony metastasis. We, here, we there commonly are two, get such headache yeah, patients. So, here yeah. there are two scenarios. If the patient is having persistent headache because of the dural bony metastasis, I think first and the foremost will be the medical management, that is the analgesic. <clears throat> we give a trial of analgesic for at least a seven days. If the patient is uh, controlled on analgesic, we delay the radiation therapy and let the medical oncologist start on the systemic therapy, see the response. If the patient is not having any relief with the analgesic trial, then we should uh, give local therapy, that is the radiation therapy, to have the effect on the pain relief. Fine. So, Dr. Gagan, would you agree with it, sir? Uh, yeah, I mean, if if it is not working, you know, I'm sure they will be using the medical oncologist. You, 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 Dr. Rand, you will be using the bisphosphonates and all. I think something or the other will work in this sort of because it's uh, it's it's uh, this this type of ribs and these type of things we don't always uh, treat unless uh, it's beyond the uh, benefit from all the other therapies. So we won't treat. That. So, so basically. Which whatever can be treated by drugs or WHO pain ladder system, we'll try and do that. And in the, in such metastasis, radiation would be kept in the last. That's what we agree on. So we have had a patient who had midline shift <laughs> because, because of, of, of the spine. bony met. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you know, in that scenario, if, the, if there is a pressure symptom, then I don't think so that the analgesic will give you a pain relief. Uh, so better than EBRT. So in that scenario, you need to have the local radiation therapy for reducing the symptomatic, um, for reducing the pressure symptoms. I agree. Nothing to disagree. Absolutely. If it's causing, if the, if the component inside the uh, inner table is causing so much soft tissue that it's having midline shift, then so it's uh, imperative to give radiation right away. Probably the first thing that you should do is that. Now, my third scenario is prophylaxis. Prophylaxis. Now we have patients who have had pain in the pelvis and there is a subtrochantric lesion which is present. So would we like to treat that patient? If he has the pain score is just about three and four, which is being well managed with ultraset and, uh, and Mobizox and all those painkillers we are able to manage. But would, uh, if uh, uh, Dr. Arun Gupta, sir, would you like to intervene in such patients at present? I don't think so. I don't think so. So, no, interventional radiology will not have any role. So, radiation oncologist, Dr. Gagan, would you like to interfere in the weight-bearing area, which is there? The, there is mild disper, disburs, uh, disturbance in the quality of life. So, would you like us to send the patient to you for the... Uh, yes, please. Yeah, yes, please. So, uh, if, the, if the bone is not uh, highly threatened for uh, pathological fracture, then we give radiation therapy. 
and that radiation therapy due to its effect on the tumor cells and of course the local effects it leads to an early bone remodeling and that leads to strengthening of the bone and decrease of the skeletal related events in terms of uh, uh, you know bone breakage and so on and so forth so so yes radiation therapy to uh, weight bearing areas is is very important no sometimes they get confused with the, with the clavicle or the acromion do we consider as weight bearing or is it just managed to be with uh, clavicle is clavicle is yes it is weight bearing but it's not bearing, bearing a lot of weight but acromion is very unique that way because the moment you move your arm you will get pain when you have acromial metastasis so it's very irritating these metastasis scapular and acromial metastasis so i would say that for the sake of pain relief these patients should be getting radiation therapy but these are very tricky areas one should be very careful use uh, uh, 3d uh, planning and everything otherwise don't do it otherwise if you don't have 3d planning if, if of course all of us have 3d planning but if somebody doesn't have it don't use it because the lung uh, toxicity will be huge if you don't do it proper so dr arun sir sir i want to ask you what all are the indications when the oncologist should send the patient to you in case the patient has pain so what all indications are there sir so if we if see the peripheral the peripheral parts like i said i think these are well easily managed by medications as well as possibly the radiation has a better role so in my opinion the the if vertebral if the patient is having fracture and acute pain then for immediate relief of pain uh the vertebral plasty should be offered followed by radiation therapy and uh like if there is some some issues like uh some soft tissue peripheral lesions are also respond well to the cryo soft tissue lesions like ribs and all here cryo has a very good role uh nearly painless procedure and uh, well tolerated so those are the cases where cryo so thermal ablations only with cryo with the soft tissue parts are preferred modalities to treat these patients so celiac axis block brachial plexus block you also do it or only the pain uh, pain specialist no, does it celiac celiac axis block uh, ir sir doing you are also doing so sir what are the indications for celiac axis blockage when should we send the refer and what stage so celiac so i think if, if it is not 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 controlled by the uh, the medical management those are the those are the uh, cases where uh, the celiac axis block can, can be offered can be offered and when you counsel the patient sir what do you counsel it's the success ratio 60 70% or yeah, what, what, what and definitely. it will remain for about 3 4 months or yes, 6 yes. months so, so this is the truth and we have to tell the patient the truth about okay. this So, Doctor Kunal, would you like to add anything else for telling us where, when, all we can send the patient to you? Yes. Uh, at what stage should we send? So, uh, one uh, another uh, thing <coughs> is where the acetabulum, uh, the pain in the pelvis, like the acetabular roof, uh, which needs to be reconstructed because of uh, limping uh, or uh, the metastatic to the uh, the acetabulum. Okay. Okay. so i think we have had enough discussion for uh, the emergencies the prophylaxis and the routine cases with this i'll, I'll thank all my esteemed panelists for a wonderful discussion uh, uh, dr gagan yes sir uh, uh, dr sushant i i really am very curious about Pro- professor jp sir when he asked that is there a different dose required for nitic or sclerotic metastasis when he said the bone rolling yes. if professor jp sir can just uh, lift the curtain off this that question the so jp sir over to you for the remark and the no, remark so, so the, okay so the question was so when we are going to do a, in a mixed setting vis-a-vis in a sclerotic setting we need to define very carefully when we deposit our doses so in a in a complete osteolytic doses uh, the doses don't get deposited in the central part so we need to be very very careful uh, when we do the planning especially when we are doing a high dose irradiation and definitely bisphosphonates etc are important and also we should be uh, very careful about the vertebral fracture especially when we are treating with the high dose fracture radiations like sbrt 
so at that time it sometimes it becomes tricky when you are dosing with a high dose radiation so my colleague kunal and all comes to our rescue at that point of time lastly i want to say that please don't forget the toxicity we need to take care of the toxicity be a invasive procedure infection etc etc or a spillage posteriorly so we have to be very very careful and do a judicious work so the the pain or the symptomatology is alleviated mitigated as quickly as possible and effectively as well as without toxicity that should be our ultimate aim and gagan and everybody i am so thankful and grateful to you all um for keeping me on my toes here okay so and uh, back to arun um anything you want to wrap up the whole sessions so i think it was a wonderful session and uh, we have a good discussion even i learned a lot of things and uh, so first i would like to thank this academy of lung cancer who is doing this wonderful job of uh, all the issues related with the lung cancer <laughs> i would like to thank the chairpersons dr pavitran dr sham dr jp agrawal and also the our very nice speakers dr priya tiwari dr ashish gulia dr kunal ghala and dr gagan and also a special thanks to sushant who has taken uh, we have given him this offered him this to run this panel discussion very late and he has accepted it and did it wonderfully and also all the panelists dr pankaj goyal dr kunal dr uh, anil i thank you all and uh, possibly after uh, we'll see you all in the our next webinar thank you thank you dr anil thank you thank you thank you all have a good day ahead thank you all faculties